Good afternoon, everyone. I want to greet everyone who is um, here on the campus of University of Nebraska at Omaha in the CPAC building, uh, who is present, and also those of you who are attending this event by means of Zoom. Um, it's a pleasure for us to, to be able to present another one of these talks here at the University of Nebraska. And, and first thing I would like to do is to, to thank those organizations that are sponsoring this event. Um, and those would be the American Institute of Iranian Studies, the History Department here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and the Schwab Center for Israel and uh, Jewish Studies here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Um, it's a pleasure for us to have a distinguished um, professor of history, um, Professor Lior Sternfeld, um, here to talk today about a very interesting and uh, a relatively new area of research concerning Iran and uh, the minority communities in Iran. Professor Sternfeld is an associate professor of history and Jewish studies at Penn State University um, right now. He's been there since 2015, um, teaching uh, both Middle Eastern history and as well as uh, courses in Jewish studies. I might also mention that, uh, that he also taught for a year at Dartmouth College and also at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, from where he has his um, doctoral degree. And his dissertation was also related to Jewish history, like the talk to, that he's going to give today, and was entitled Reclaiming Their Past, Writing Jewish History in Iran During the Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and Early Revolutionary Periods, 1941 to 1989. Um, let me say a little bit more about uh, Professor Sternfeld and his work. He is a social historian of the modern Middle East with particular interest in the histories of the Jewish people and other minorities in the region. His first book, which um, he's going to talk more about in this, um, in this talk today, is entitled Between Iran and Zion. Jewish Histories of 20th Century Iran, which was published in 2018 by Stanford University um, Press. And it also, it examines against the backdrop of the Iranian, of Iranian nationalism and Zionism and constitutionalism, the development and integration of Jewish communities in Iran into the nation building projects of the last century. And like I said, this is a, for those students of, of Iran and modern Iranian history, the study of the minority communities in Iran, not just the Jewish communities, but also the Armenian communities, Zoroastrian community and others, is a relatively new area of research, um, which we're, uh, we're going to learn a lot of, of, about today. Um, I might also, add to that, that he is um, also currently working on two new book projects and that he teaches courses not only in the modern Middle East, but also on Iran, also on Jewish histories of the region, and also on Israel and Palestine. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Lior Sternfeld here to the University of Nebraska at Omaha and um, to give this talk to us today. Thank you very much. Her glasses. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. James Clark for organizing this talk uh, and the organization who sponsored it for their support and Kendall who made the, this, the whole logistics of it uh, so surprisingly pleasant. <laughs> Um, in 1941, the JDC, the American Jewish Distribution Committee, uh, started to work in Iran. It's an international, it's the biggest uh, Jewish aid organization in the world. Um, and they came to work in Iran, uh, mostly because of the recent arrival of hundreds of thousands of Polish refugees 
uh, in in the story of World War II, uh, about 20,000 of them were Jewish. I can talk more about it later, the circumstances under which they came, but when the JDC was getting ready to work in the country, they first tried to um, they first tried to understand what they were dealing with in Iran. Um, in terms of local population, they found out that there were about 100,000 Jews living in, in Iran. About 10% of them belong to the country's elites, the financial, industrial, 10% uh, belong to the new uh, emerging urban middle class, and 80% were impoverished, low, uh, low middle classes. Um, they were invisible part of the Iranian society, living in the geographical and social peripheries of Iran. Now, fast forward, uh, roughly four decades later, in 1977, the same organization once again served the community. They found out that once again, the number of Jews living in the country was about 100,000, but this time, 10% belong to the country's elite, still is the same survey. But now 80% belong to the middle and upper middle classes. Only 10% were still considered impoverished, poor, and lower classes. Uh, another scholar of Iranian Jews, Daniela Farah, showed uh, recently in her published article that the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is a network of Jewish schools that um, it was a French network of Jewish schools that was very popular in, in among Jewish communities of the Middle East and North Africa. In their reports, they also showed uh, pointed out to similar data. In addition to that, we see from David Seaton, historian of Sephardic communities, that in 1979, two out of 18 members of the Royal Academy of Sciences were Jews. 80 out of 4,000 university professors were Jews. 600 out of 10,000 physicians were Jews. The story of this incredible transformation is the one that I want to tell you today. And the one that I hope I was trying, uh, the, the one that I, I was trying at least to, to tell in my, in my book. And this is one that has to be read alongside with the political and social history of Iran in the 20th century. One that included two all-consuming revolutions and many more political earthquakes. Part of this journey was to study the phenomenal development, uh, to study this phenomenal development uh, has to connect with the way that we see and read Iranian Jewish history. Almost every narrative of Iranian Jewish history, official, scholarly, com community or family narratives, starts with the Babylonian exile 2,700 years ago. You ask an Iranian Jew to tell you their story, and they will say, my family came here 2,700 years ago. In a way, it reflects the state of the field of Iranian Jewish history. The tendency of writing this long history as a one linear narrative goes far beyond the informal or family community narratives. The field of Iranian Jewish history lacks the depth and breadth that do justice to the rich history of these communities. This was true before the revolution of 1979 and is even truer today. A few years ago, when I was in grad school at the University of Texas at Austin, when I compiled my reading list for the comprehensive exams, there was one monograph, one book on Jewish Iranian history in the 20th century. That book was Habib Levy's, The Comprehensive History of the Jews of Iran, that was written in 1961 and covered the history of Iranian Jews since the Babylonian exile some 2,700 years ago. There's a lot to say about this corpus of Habib Levy his own history, training, and life, and I'm happy to get to it later in the Q&A. But now, shall we ask, can one book of three volumes in the Persian original edition discuss 2,700 years in a nuanced and sophisticated way? After the 1979 revolution, with the relocation of the majority of Iranian Jews to the US, we see that the way Iranian Jews talked about their history and wrote their history has changed drastically. Iranian Jews now had to position themselves, not just in relation to the US majority society, but also vis-a-vis -vis 
the dominant, mostly Ashkenazi American Jewish community. We see how the language to describe their experiences their, in the previous homeland has changed. They borrowed terms from the vocabulary that Ashkenazi American Jews used to describe their histories back in Europe. Events of unrest became pogroms, a term that was never used by Iranian Jews back in the day. And also it means something very different from what we, uh, I mean, academically, it means something very different, very different. Um, the Mahale, the Jewish neighborhood turned into a ghetto. Now I want to show you, so this is, ah, I, let me, yeah, for the, <laughs> for the Zoom participants, I'll have to go back here and share the screen. And can you tell me that this is what we see now? Perfect, all right. So I want to show you here a photo from Habib Levy's uh, 1961 edition of his book. Ah. <laughs> we see here um, um, an image from Habib Levy's 1961 uh, book in Persian on, on history of Iranian Jews. And we see a photo of the entrance to the Mahale in Tehran, the Jewish neighborhood. And it says here, Yaki as Mahale Yahud Tehran. One of the entrances to the Jewish Mahale in Tehran. Now, in 1999, the same, uh, the, the book was translated and published in English. Um, and we see the same photo with the caption and entrance to the Tehran ghetto. Now, the usage of ghetto is not just borrowing a neutral term from a different language. Using ghetto in a Jewish context after 1945 creates a world of, image, of images that do not necessarily reflect correctly or contextualize Jewish history in Iran. Just to take from a close enough example to show the difference, Harat al-Yahud in Cairo remained Harat al-Yahud in the Jewish writing and writing on Jews in Cairo, otherwise it's translated as Jewish quarter. It tells us something much broader about our ability to think about Jewish history in non-Western societies in general, but also about Iran specifically. The narrative as it goes is that Iranian Jews saw themselves as Iranian. They stayed out of politics, celebrated their Persian heritage. Suleiman Chaim, for example, uh, suffered from hatred and discrimination that stopped for a while under the Pahlavi monarchy. The community was very Zionist and the uh, alliance between Israel and the Pahlavi government uh, also supports that notion. And that history ended in 1979 revolution, by the way, with a Zionist redemption. Such narrative prevents us from seeing the immense diversity of the Iranian Jewish community and the many voices that existed in the community throughout the years. The pushback usually comes when talking about the political activism, when talking about their involvement in the Communist Party, in the Tudor Party, in a way that we don't see in cases like Iraq or Egypt. It prevents us from investigating the nature of Middle Eastern and Iranian communism, or even to analyze what the term Iranian Zionism mean. We already know that Jews were a prominent part of the Communist parties in other Middle Eastern countries like Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, and others. And we know that until 1948, Jews were pretty assimilated in their uh, respective Middle Eastern societies. And no one would make such assertions regarding Jews in other Middle Eastern countries or others. So why do we see it here? There is a very good visual explanation. I showed it in one of the classes of Dr. Clark yesterday. Um, visual explanation of that historiographical, historiographical mold. Uh, Mayor Gal uh, is, is a visual artist, uh, Israeli visual artist, and, uh, and in 1999, he published this work. It's called Nine Out of 400, The West and the Rest. And what we see here is him holding a history, high school history textbook. Um, nine out of the 400 pages are dedicated to the Middle East. Uh, not Middle East Jews, not modern Middle East, the entire Middle Eastern history in nine pages. Um, and Medigal's work shows us how little we care to know 
about the Middle East. And it's been part of, of much larger issue in the Israeli society, 50% of which is of Middle Eastern background. And then I wanted to see in real numbers how come we have such a shallow understanding of the Jewish Iranian experience. And that's what I found. I went to uh, WorldCat uh, students. This is your best friend, even though it's a cat. Uh, <laughs> Um, I searched Jews, Iran, history, 20th century, and I got back 31 results. Um, there is one book of Habib Levy, the one that I mentioned. Uh, there are a few edited collections of essays, a few dissertations and master thesis, um, VHS home videos, um, Judeo-Persian literature, 31 results. Now, I searched 19th century. I, you know, we have to start somewhere. So maybe, maybe there's a basis to start with the 19th century. And it returned 10 results. And two of them are actually very good books. And again, we see uh, one collected um, volume or one a a collection of, of essays. Um, this, is, this is hardly enough to, uh, to work with when it comes to research, to scholarship. I searched the broadest possible term, Iran, Jews, Iran history, and it returned 390 results. And this is everything that is out there everything. Now, I went and changed the name of the country to see what we are dealing with in other, in other cases of the Middle East. So I searched Jews, Egypt history, 20th century. It returned 105 results. Not a whole lot, but three times more than Iran. Iraq, 122 results. The United States, 1,503. China, 154. And to be honest, I searched China because I thought that it would return zero. I didn't know that there was relevant Jewish history in China, and it returned uh, five times more than uh, the case of Iran. So, and, and you know, to go to the obvious, I searched Jews, Germany, history, 20th century, and it returned 2,794 results. So with such thin body of scholarship, there's nothing to be surprised at that superficial understanding. Now, I want to provide a quick overview of history of Zionism in Iran. Zionism first came to the fore in Europe as a national movement of European Jews. In a way, it was reaction to the European enlightenment and nationalism. We see the conversation in the Jewish communities regarding Zionism in the, 18, in the 1890s onwards, and we see a movement that offered Jews decent existence in a place that wouldn't reject them as Europe did. Or even true would be to say Eastern Europe. So, you know, if we narrow it down, the, the, what the deal of Zionism was for the Jews, you can become fully European when you migrate out of Europe. At this point, no leader of the nascent Zionist movement even considered Oriental Jews as part of the future Israeli or Zionist society. The Oriental Jews themselves, having had very different experience in the 19th and early 20th centuries, did not articulate a clear response to the political developments in Europe. Moreover, the Jews of the Middle East had not undergone the process of secularization that was essential to the Zionist paradigm and maintained the religious perception of Eretz Israel the Ottoman mandatory Palestine as the Holy Land. And I should say that one of the, my favorite um, paradoxes of Zionism is that we, uh, you know, it's a very secular movement in its essence. And the, my favorite paradox is uh, we don't believe in God, but he offered us this land. <laughs> he promised us this land. Um, Jews from the Middle East and Iran immigrated in small numbers to Palestine throughout the ages. 
But we have to remember that the region was part of the Ottoman Empire, so travels were indeed pretty common, especially for pilgrimage and the economy that facilitated it. The message of political Zionism first struck chord with Iranian Jews in 1917, following the Balfour Declaration, that came at the same time of the first disillusion, uh, disillusionment Iranian Jews experienced with the outcomes of the Constitutional Revolution. All of a sudden, a promise of relocating to place of their own sounded rather tempting. Iranian Jews established Zionist associations to teach Hebrew and to handle the preparation for a mass exodus. However, shortly after, in 1925, with the ascendance of Reza Pahlavi as the new Shah, who overthrew the Qajar dynasty, the new national project and the vision of new Iranian society with almost diminished role of religion and emphasis on ethnic identity made the Jews shelf their plans for relocation. Reza Shah removed all the laws that barred Jews and other minorities from living in certain areas, engaged in some occupations and joined the army, for example. Jews have now became, become nominally equal part of the Iranian society. Zionism remained a more clandestine underground operation. Zionist organizations could operate openly in some fields like teaching Hebrew and then band altogether. Uh, sympathies to Zionism and different interpretations for Zionism started to split the communities in the 1930s. Shmuel Chaim, Monsieur Chaim, as he's called by uh, Iranian Jews, uh, the Jewish representative to the Majlis um, had a harsh di disagreement with another Jewish dignitary, Lokman Nahorai. While Nahorai espoused the interpretation and perhaps the practice that Jews should join full force the Zionist international organizations, Chaim believed that Zionism is overall a positive development, but Iranian Jews should fight for the rights and status in Iran and not to forfeit it for any messianic dream. Chaim published a newspaper called the Chaim Life, in which he preached for integration efforts for the Jews, participation in political life and developing national consciousness. Uh, Chaim was actually executed by Reza Shah for mostly false accusation of being complicit in an attempt to assassinate him. In any case, following this incident, any non-Iranian organized movement was banned from operating in Iran and Zionism was part of it. World War II, changed things around once again. Uh, in 1941, the Allied armies invaded and occupied Iran and forced Reza Shah to abrogate in favor of his son, Mohammed Reza, who opened the political sphere to any and every political movement, including Zionism. For the first time, Zionist organizations based in mandatory Palestine opened headquarters in Tehran and other Iranian cities to care for the needs of Jewish Polish refugees that had arrived in Iran, but that's part of another story. In any case, after seeing the Polish refugees who fled Europe, first the Nazis and then Stalin Soviet Union, Iranian Jews went through a couple of stages. One, their leadership recognized the need to help their brethren over in Europe, escape the Nazis first, and then to help them establish a national home. This obviously made the case for Zionism in Iran and more and more Iranians connected to the message of Jewish redemption out of Zionism. Another thing that happened among Jews is that just like non-Jewish Iranians, they found political home in the newly formed Communist Party. They supported and joined it for many reasons. The main reason was the to the party being the fiercest opposition to, uh, to fascist forces in Iran and outside and their struggle for egalitarian society, something that resonated with Iranian Jews that I remind you back then were still lower classes, broadly speaking. One interviewee for my research was born in Tehran in the early 1930s and now is residing in North America. At the age of 16, he joined the Tudor party and remained an active member for more than three decades. His political activity landed him in Qasr, the Shah's prison, half dozen times before he left Iran. He told me, I quote, I knew nothing about Marx or Marxism when I joined the Tudor. I joined because this was the only place that they didn't call me Juhud, which is a derogatory term for Jews. I learned Marxism in Qasr prison shortly after I joined the party." End quote. So, and, and again, just you know, to set the record straight, the Tudor party was the only party that allowed non-Muslims to be full members. So if 
they wanted to be active at all in the Iranian political sphere, there was only one venue open for them. On top of that, Jews published communist leaning newspapers. Um, for example, Nisan, named after the Hebrew month of Nisan, that we are now on the fourth day of it, um, and Bene Adam. Both of them were semi official publications of the Tudor the party. Um, they had different goals. One of them, uh, well, both tried to reach out to the more remote Jewish communities, those that don't necessarily live in, in Tehran or the big cities, uh, try to make the case for them to join the Tudor, to support, uh, to highlight the struggle of the Tudor against anti Semitism, anti Jewish activities, against new inclusive Iran, um, and also to, uh, to show. Uh, the benefit of, of socialism in other countries and some of it uh, borders uh, what we call today fake news, but, <laughs> but these were very important and they, their distribution went far beyond the, the limits of the Jewish community because the official to the publications were often censored and banned. And in, that, in the times when the official publications were banned, the Jewish publications became the mouthpiece for the party's leadership. So they were very important for the operation of the, of the party. So the, the two, they had uh, the Jewish participation in, in the media, but also there were high ranking Jews in the leadership of the party. But we have to remember that mainstream Zionism was a socialist movement too, self-described. The socialist elements of the movement were extremely dominant and extremely socialist. At around the same time of the 1940s, they established the kibbutzim in future Israel. And the kibbutzim were perhaps one of the biggest communist experiments in human history. At that point, one could easily feel sympathies for the Zionist project, while at the same time being affiliated with the Iranian Communist Party and fighting alongside the Iranian national movement against the Soviet in the North and the British in the South. Indeed, a multi-hyphenated identity such as Iranian nationalist, communist Zionist was not a rare sight. And I, in, I, one of my interviewees uh, immigrated to Israel in the 1950s um, and he, in conversation with uh, an official a, a clerk in the, in the state bureaucracy, um, he said that he views himself as, as a Zionist, communist and Iranian nationalist. And, uh, and the clerk told him, you better choose one of them and it better be not communist and not Iranian nationalist. Um, after the establishment of Israel in 1948, the Zionist movement could no longer be considered a non-state actor. Having discovered the terrible loss of 6 million Jews in the Holocaust, 6 millions that would have been the human reservoir for Israel, Israel had to find another source to make up for that loss. Again, while it was not their intention in the first place, in 1948, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's prime minister, ordered to find them among the Mizrahi Jews, Jews of the Arab and Muslim Middle East. Um, in the Middle East, from Morocco to Iran, from Yemen to Turkey, there were about 950,000 Jews living. The Israeli goals were to make them immigrate en masse. It worked in some of the communities for several reasons, but we see the Yemenite community live in Yemen, Jews in Syria, Lebanon, and Libya, left, left almost completely by 1949, uh, 1953, 56, depending on different uh, chronological uh, line. Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria by 1956, but in Iran, where Zionist where Zionist organizations could operate completely openly and the population was pretty sympathetic to Zionism, the Jews did not consider political Zionism to be their ideal solution. Rather, they were going through rapid process of urbanization, of becoming integral part of their homeland society and global politics helped them make multi-layered and once identities and loyalties. In the early 1950s, Habib Levy, the same Habib Levy from the comprehensive book, wrote a report for the Jewish agency in Jerusalem, lamenting the loss of the entire young generation that preferred leftist Iranian organizations over Zionist ones. To that mix, we can add socialist Zionist political parties, especially from the spectrum of the kibbutzim movement that 
were sent uh, as emissaries to Iran, and they found mutual ground themselves with Iranian socialists and communists. And I want to take a, a minute to talk about the, um, you know, the relations of the Iranian intellectual with, uh, with Israel and Zionism. This is Jalal Ahmad. Uh, I think it's safe to say that he is the most important Iranian intellectual of the 20th century. Uh, he was the, the prophet of leftist internationalism and, and Iranian uh, and Iranian opposition or Iranian position within the nascent third world. In 1964, he visited Israel and he went to Kibbutz Ayelet Shachar in Israel. And I found in the Kibbutz guest book uh, what he wrote and his wife, Simin Danishvar, also a very famous, very prominent uh, Iranian novelist. And they wrote, regardless of the hospitality, I saw here people I've never expected to meet, learn people, understanding, open-minded, in a sense they are implementing Platon. Honestly speaking, I always identified Israel with the kibbutz, and now I understand why. And Danishvar wrote, as I see it, the kibbutz is the answer to the problems of all the countries, including our own. As a former kibbutzik, I giggle every time I see it. Um, in any case, um, Jar Ahmad also published his travelogue uh, in few installment in, on, in the Iranian press. And it, uh, it was quite controversial. Uh, Ali Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran today, recalls that when he was a student in the seminary in Qom, they couldn't, they couldn't decide what to make of it. How come the icon of Iranian leftism uh, wrote so admiringly on Israel? But he changed in 1967. In 1967, Israel turned from a post-colonial country in the perception of Iranian intellectuals into a colonial country. It, with the occupation of the, uh, of the West Bank and, uh, and the Golan Heights and the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip, Israel turned into colonial power and Jalal Ahmad added, so the book was published in uh, it, the travelogue was published in four installments and he added another chapter and then collected it to a book in 1969, just before he died. Um, and the last chapter was just bashing Israel for what happened to it after 1967. But again, this, the story is even more complicated than that. In those days, we see Zionist and Israeli involvement in Jewish life in Iran. Zionist clubs and youth movements were active. However, Iranian youth did not engage Zionism as Israeli officials had hoped. Indeed, Zionism had become more complex than in 1917. The 25,000 Iranian Jews that had immigrated to Israel around 1948 to 1951 were the poorest and the neediest of the Iranian Jewish communities. But there were myriad stories at the time of Jews who had immigrated and returned to Iran or immigrated and wanted to return. The important thing was that Iranian Jews overall had a sober idea of what was waiting for them on the other side of the Zionist story, unlike any other uh, Middle Eastern Jewish society that had no way to go back or to report back. A telling example is given in Stanley Abramowitz, one of the directors of the JCC in Iran, and he reported in 1951, uh, where he describes one instance of Jews from Nehevand, and I quote, the letters that come from Israel dampen all spirits. The Iranian Jew is not Halutzik, the pioneer type. The ordeals of present day life in Israel have left him discouraged, longing to return to his damp, dark ghetto room, for he has been used to that room and even liked it. Food is available in Iran, and though he earned little, he lived in an environment which was not strange to him. The language, the people, the life was familiar, Israel is not. As a Persian, he is looked down upon. The letters that come back to Iran complain about shortage of food. Nehvan received a letter and a Torah scroll from their brethren in Israel. The Nehvan Jews in Israel signed their names on this piece of scroll, and in the accompanying letter, they wrote that they took an oath by the Torah from which they sent a piece that their brethren in Nehvan will not come to Israel now, anyway, not until they inform them that the time is more suitable. 
and Nehevand is a God-forsaken place in the mountains of Luristan, cut off from the outside world. Yet the Lenchlight in Israel advised them, adjured them to remain in Nehevand. Another family was advised not to leave for Israel until the son Joseph is married. Joseph is one year old. Another, so, and this is also something that I want to show you. There's this, again, in, in historiography, there's this simplistic understanding that there was whatever was between 1948 and 1967 was one thing. And then from 1967, Israel basically went into hiding in Iran because they couldn't, if, if the circle of intellectuals turned against them, they, they don't have anyone to speak with. So I, I present <laughs> um, uh, evidence A here, uh, exhibit A, right? Uh, this is the, the poster for the Moulin Rouge uh, cabaret lineup in 1969. So supposedly at the height of the anger against Israel. And we see here, and I'll use this fancy uh, um, pointer. Uh, we see here uh, some of the biggest stars of the Iranian uh, entertainment world. Uh, Gugush, who is the biggest diva in Iran until today. I mean, she lives in the US today, but she's considered to be the biggest diva of Iranian culture. Uh, Vigen, uh, also a very important uh, star. But at the top of this lineup, we see the international, the, the Israeli singer uh, Tova Porat. Um, and this is something that, you know, this is not in the hiding. This is the, one of the most important cultural institutions in Iran. And they present at the top of it, she came for a month of residency in the Moulin Rouge, performed every night, recorded uh, albums with uh, two Iranian singers. Um, this is hardly, uh, you know, secret relations between Israel and Iran. Um, moreover, there was Israeli film festival uh, that was uh, that took place on the external walls of the Israeli embassy on uh, Kach Street, which is turned into Philistine. Um, so, you know, uh, this is some, you know, to put things in, in context. Now, another interesting and nuanced interpretation for Zionism comes from Elias S. Hakyan. Elias S. Hakyan was a teacher and principal of Alian schools in, in Iran for over 25 years. He wrote in his memoir, Iran has been my homeland, Vatan and Jerusalem has been the source of my belief in God and my Qibla. Qibla is the direction of the prayer. And he uses Qibla, and this is important because it's provoking a very Islamic concept of direction of prayer. This quotation suggests yet again that many Iranian Jews had different interpretations for Zionism than the one that the Jewish agency in Israel advanced. As Hakyan was a role model for many Iranians, and it is clear that his national identity of Iranian did not interfere with his religious identity as a Jew. He proudly projected this combined identity throughout this, his career, which may have inspired and encouraged students to, uh, to follow uh, suit. Now, during the revolution, um, it's also interesting to see what happened in the Jewish communities. Um, in 1978, March 1978, nine months before the Shah left Iran, uh, the Jewish community held elections for the leadership of the community, regular elections. And the old leadership that was very much identified with Zionism and Israel was voted out. And a group that called themselves the, uh, the Association of Jewish Iranian Intellectuals um, was elected to lead the community. This group was revolutionary. So in a way, the Jewish community revolutionized itself even before the rest of the country. The, this uh, organization was established by two very prominent activists in the Tudor party. They were in prison together with some of the leaders of the revolution. For example, Ayatollah Talekhani. Uh, I think that I have, no, I don't have a photo of him. Uh, Ayatollah Talekhani, who was the right hand of Khomeini in Iran while he was in exile. Uh, and together they 
thought about ways to get the Jewish community involved in the revolution. Uh, one of them was publishing newspaper called uh, Tammuz that was meant to advance integration and uh, integration of Iranian Jews into the post-monarchy, uh, post-Shah Iran, post pahlavi Iran. Um, they organized uh, um, participation of Jews in the anti-Shah demonstrations uh, in, in, uh, in 1978, 1979. And also one of, the, one of the most beautiful stories of the Jewish side in the revolution, in my, in my opinion, <laughs> is the story of the uh, Sapir Charity Hospital in Tehran. It's one of the, it's the oldest charity hospital in the Middle East and uh, the only one that is held by the Jewish community. Um, in 1978, 1979, there were very violent demonstrations against the Shah. The army, you know, was brutal in the attempts to, uh, to um, deal with the demonstrations. And there were four hospitals, uh, state hospitals in Tehran, and there was the one Jewish hospital. Sometime in 1978, the Shah, the Savak, the secret police of the Shah ordered the, the hospitals, the state hospitals to report on wooden, wounded uh, protesters so they can be taken into custody uh, when, after they're treated. The one hospital that never reported about wounded protesters was the, uh, the Jewish hospital. Um, they even went as far as establishing the Talakani help groups that the hospital got messages from Talakani about locations and times of demonstrations and the hospital would send ambulances to the place of the demonstration before it even started. So they would be the first to pick up the protesters. There are amazing stories from the time, and I, I write more about it in my book. It's, uh, there are a few things that I want to say about this story. One is that not all the doctors, not all the physicians or the nurses in the hospital were supporters of the revolution. Some of them were proud supporters of the Shah, and they were even, some of them even considered themselves friends of the Shah. But for them, this was not about politics. This was about being Iranian, being, and you know, at the entrance to the hospital, it says, love thy neighbor like thyself in Hebrew and Persian. And for them, this was loving the neighbors. Um, and some of them, again, did it with, while opposing the revolution, because for them, this was a humanitarian issue. Um, I can talk about it later too, but uh, there are so many stories, I can't fit it all. <laughs> With the delicate situation between Israel and Iran since 1979, the Jews of Iran were even more courageous to remain true to their own interpretation of Judaism and Zionism. Even after the revolution, Iranian Jews emigrated to the US and much fewer to Israel. About 25 to 30% of the community chose to stay in Iran in the immediate aftermath. The community, uh, they still recognize the right of Israel to exist, of course, uh, and are interested in the going on in Israel. They visit Israel and many of them have relatives there. Even when speaking in public, in the press or the parliament, they say that the most deplorable thing about Israel is not its existence, but its refusal to become part of the Middle East, to make peace with the Arab neighbors, and, to issue, and other issues concerning uh, ethnic tensions in Israel. I would like to end uh, with a short excerpt from one of my favorite memoirs on the Jewish Iranian experience in the 1970s. It was written by an Iranian Jewish um, novelist and journalist, Roya Hagakian. It's called Journey from the Land of No, where she tells about the Passover Seder night in her family house in Tehran, 1977, uh, and you know, Passover is just 10 days away and uh, it, it resonates uh, uh, with, with the, time of, the time of the year. Um, I quote, naturally it caused an uproar at the Seder when father asked Uncle Ardi to read the Halachma. 
Everyone burst into laughter even before he began. He obeyed and read, but not without a touch of subversion, a bit of mischief. This is the bread of affliction, some affliction that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. This year we are slaves, may this slavery never end. This year here, next year at home in Israel, pardon me for not packing. The family dreamed of the land of milk and honey, but wanted to wake up in Tehran. After reciting the Halachma, Uncle Adi asked, so Hakakyan, are your bags packed or the flight to Jerusalem postponed for another year? Father smiled and waved him away, assuming his questions had been meant in jest, but Uncle Adi, without the slightest hint at humor, pressed on, really Hakakyan, why say it? Why not leave it at love thy neighbor like thyself and call off the rest? At this point I should end and I would love to take questions if there's any. Thank you very much. They all seem to do very well financially. My question is, are the Iranians really accepted in the midst of society, or are they accepted as a still sensitive as a group and therefore likely to be placed in the That's a very good question. I assume that the show is the Shaz of Sunset. <laughs> Um, because I, I'm going to talk about it tonight at the Jewish Community Center. Um, the development of the Iranian Jewish community in the US uh, is, is, a fascinating, uh, is a fascinating story uh, because the roots are here in the story of the 20th century in Iran. Um, this is, in many ways, this is one of the newest minority communities in the US. Um, there was not a viable Iranian Jewish community, or by the way, any Iranian community in the US before 1977. Uh, there were many students that were sent uh, from the Iranian, from Iran on the Iranian government's dime to study here and, and get, go back to Iran. Uh, but there was not, uh, there was not uh, a, an Iranian community here. And, um, and part of it was because of their perception of their national identity and their sense of belonging that is just unparalleled. And, uh, and when they came to Los Angeles, um, they, they were trying to create another Iran. They tried to create, and they did create uh, Terangelis. Uh, which is if you walk on Westwood Boulevard, or as they call it, Westwood, um, it's, it's like time capsule of Iran in some time in the past. Uh, the restaurants, the bookstores, the, the Chaykhane, uh, these, are all, uh, these are all taken from, from back home. Um, and um, and they consider themselves to be very, I think that they have two channels of communication, one internal and one external. Internally, they are very cohesive and, and there are reasons for that too. Uh, but they consider themselves to be uh, um, American patriots like no other. And they have, they built a community story that reflects that. Uh, but again, I'm going to do a whole lecture about it tonight, so. <laughs> Wait for my next book. Any <laughs> other questions? And uh, since you're also apparently interested in other libraries, um, this entire transformation, this rise of the cultural and status of the Jews in Iran over this 40 or 50 year period, is there a similar experience among other minority groups like Jews? Uh, in the 20th century, I would say that most minority groups in Iran experienced the same kind of development that was assisted by the nation building project of the Shah that made it more hospitable to non-Muslims. Uh, the reduction in the status of clerics, uh, the, the emphasis on the pre-Islamic history, and this is something that we can see in 1971, 
in the celebration of 2,500 years of, of Persian Iranian monarchy, um, we see that they were trying to, you know, to connect the dots of 20th century Iran and very much pre-Islamic pre Iran. Um, so it gave rise to, it gave more opportunities to non-Muslims in Iran. Um, it was, I say, I'd say that it was also connected to uh, the Persian identity. So Armenians had more challenges to overcome than Iranian Jews that had no other language but Persian. Armenians had the Armenian language. Uh, this is their daily language. And also it was meant to exclude uh, the ethnic minorities that the Shah did not want to be so much part of, um, of, uh, of the, the nation building project. Um, unless they embrace the Persian identity. Um, and also there's something that is uh, mildly provocative, but the Shah, so you don't mind if I, <laughs> if I go ahead, uh, the Shah had um, very, interesting understanding of the place of Jews and Christians in, in Iran and in the world. Um, more than once he said publicly that the world jury, which is a concept that is problematic in and of itself, that the world jury owes him for being so good to the Iranian Jewish community. Um, and there was even a, mind-blowing interview that he gave to Mike Wallace in 1977. And, uh, you know, President Carter had just been elected and one of his uh, international uh, policy, uh, foreign policy goals was to advance human rights. And he thought that since Iran is a beneficiary of, of the US alliance, it can push the Shah to be more respectful of human rights. And the Shah, told him that he thinks that it's ungrateful of, from American Jews to be to treat him like that, to push him on that, because he was so good to them. And he said, and Mike Wallace told him, you know, that uh, you realize, sir, that this is something that is almost anti-Semitic to say. And he say, why? And because you suggest that Jews control everything. He said, what are you? And Mike Wallace was Jewish. And your editor, Jewish, and the owner of your station, Jewish. And he kept counting the Jews that he believed are shaping or were shaping the public mindset at the time. So his relations to Jews and Christians was very instrumental. He believed that treating them would ease off the pressure from outside, that they can be the bridge to the West. Um, and the Zoroastrians, for example, were the bridge to the past. So that's why he very much supported their efforts to integrate or to be more visible and more, uh, more successful too. The one minority that was always at the bottom of every Iranian uh, priority was the Baha'is. Uh, the Baha'is were, whenever he wanted, whenever the Shah wanted to appease the clergy, when he needed their support for some legislation or project or something, he threw a bone in the, like he let them do something with the Baha'is that uh, would get them off his back. Um, I hope that I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the slides, I just want to understand, it's like an understanding of what you talking about. And because we see this throughout Tehran. Yeah. And did that also 
Absolutely. So Odla John, uh, basically by the 1960s, most of the Jews that had made it moved to the new neighborhoods like uh, Yusuf Abad. Um, and the, there were two new synagogues in Yusuf Abad uh, that were much more, much bigger, much fancier than, than the old synagogues of South Tehran. Um, Udlejan remained the, the Jewish Mahalle in, in name. And also there are still, the, the Sapir Hospital is there until today. Um, and there is Jewish presence there, but it's no longer, I mean, it, it ceased to be a Jewish neighborhood uh, in the 1960s and definitely by the 70s. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Zoom is still on? Yes. Thank yeah. you to everyone. Right. Thanks to everyone who uh, attended this talk. And um, hopefully we'll have another one for you again next year. Huh? <laughs>